Wow, what a great group we have joining us today. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our event, Looking for Life Beyond Our Solar System with the James Webb Space Telescope. My name is Pauline Schaefer, and I am the education oh, manager and your host at the REACH Museum in Richland, Washington. The REACH is named for the Hanford REACH of the Columbia River, and our mission here is to inspire learning by sharing the stories of our region and our place in the universe. Our exhibits and programs here at the REACH Museum explore the history and the science of the Hanford sites, the Columbia River, and our geologic past. And in our picture that you're seeing on your screen here, you might notice our iconic arch sculpture that stands outside of our museum. And while we're getting started today, I wanna to share a couple of cool facts about those arches. Number one, did you know that that sculpture was designed by a Richland student? That is pretty cool. And number two is that that sculpture that you're seeing there is the center of a scale model of the solar system that spreads out throughout the Tri-Cities region and all the way onto the Hanford Reach National Monument. If you would like to learn more about that, um, I will put a link in the chat that leads you to our website where you can sign up for our emailed newsletter, our education newsletter, where you can learn more about that story and other education opportunities in our area. All right, I am so glad you could join us today as we look beyond the solar system. I'll be introducing our guest speakers in just a moment. But while you are adding those numbers in, I would like to share that um, I've been interested in astronomy since I was about 12 years old. My older sister took me on a camping trip and we started stargazing and learning the constellations. A local teacher here got me interested in what's going on at NASA and the European Space Agency with the new space telescope. And so I started following the progress of that telescope. And I was one of the ones crazy enough to get up at four in the morning on Christmas day to watch the launch. Um, how many of you also did that? If you did that, you can just show us a thumbs up um, reaction or put it in the chat and that'll help help me know that you were yeah that you were crazy enough like like I did to get up that early to watch the launch and it sure looks like we've got a lot of James Webb Space Telescope fans here today so let's get started a friendly reminder that you should keep yourself muted while the speakers are presenting so that everyone can hear we are recording this event and if you would like a copy of that, please contact me to request that. I'll put my, um, my contact information in the chat at the end. And there will be times in the program for uh, questions. So you may either type those in the chat or raise your hand using the reaction raise hand feature and we'll call on you to unmute and ask your question. All right, Dr. Thomas Beatty will be starting our program today and he's an assistant research professor at the University of Arizona and is on the NIRCAM instrument team. You'll learn really soon what that NIRCAM means for the James Webb Space Telescope. He also enjoys skiing and rowing and sailing, but is having a tough time doing these in the Arizona desert. Thomas has been inspired by Ernest Shackleton, the Antarctic explorer, because he never gave up even when everything went wrong. Thomas joins us today from the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, where hopefully everything is going right. Thomas Beatty. Um, I'm a research professor at the University of Arizona. I work on the NIRCAM uh, camera, the NIRCAM instrument on the James Webb Space Telescope. I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, I am out in Baltimore because uh, I am helping to run the telescope right now. Uh, actually, in about an hour and a half, one, as soon as we get off uh, with each other, I am going to walk uh, about 50 feet down the hallway that way, um, and I'm going to go uh, help run the telescope from the Missions Operations Center. So I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, at the beginning here about how the telescope works. 
uh, and show you what uh, life is like in the Mission Operations Center when we're actually operating it. Um, so before you go in, Thomas, can we also introduce Megan? Yep, Just I was right about to pause for that. Yeah. Thank you. Should I introduce myself or Pauline? I see her back now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, can, I can go ahead and introduce Megan. Um, thank you. Dr. Megan Mansfield is a NASA Sagan Fellow and member of the NASA funded Alien Earth Team. She got her education at MIT and University of Chicago. And she has been inspired by Sally Ride, the first American woman to go to space. Megan has lots of hobbies, including singing and playing the viola. Um, and so welcome to Dr. Megan Mansfield today. And I would also like to um, note that this event wouldn't be possible without the help and guidance of Dr. Serena Kim, Associate Astronomer and Associate Research Professor at the Stewart Observatory. Serena received her PhD at State University of New York Stony Brook and is inspired by scientist Marie Curie who discovered new elements because of her curiosity and out of the box thinking. Serena's work focuses on the formation of stars and disks around the young stars where planets form. She is particularly interested in environments of stellar nurseries, which resemble the birth environment of our solar system. Serena is currently a member of the NASA supported astrobiology program, Earth and Other Solar Systems and Alien Earth. So thank you, Serena, for all your work for our event today. And We'll turn it over to Dr. Beatty. All right, thanks, Pauline. Um, so like I said, I am uh, right now sitting uh, in the building of the Mission Operations Center, the mock we call it, uh, for James Webb. Um, so let's get going. I have some pictures to show you of what stuff is actually like in here. All right, is that coming through okay? Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, one second. Let me stop. I just want to make sure I'm yes. sharing this the right way. Yep, we are. Okay. Um, so like Pauline mentioned, uh, Webb launched on Christmas morning. Um, I also got up, it was about I think it was 6 a.m. where I was in, uh, in Chicago on Christmas morning. Uh, it launched from um, a launch pad in South America. So it actually was in the middle of the jungle. Um, it launched into clouds uh, very early in the morning on Christmas. It's a very nice Christmas present. Um, this is a, a picture from the top, from a camera on the very top of the rocket as James Webb came off. See, now they're in space. You can see the uh, Earth uh, up at the top here. And this silver thing is the James Webb Space Telescope. This is the last picture we're ever going to get. Uh, of what the telescope looks like from the top of the rocket. Right now, the telescope is all folded up. It needs to be folded up um, so that it can fit inside the rocket. Um, and from this point on, Webb uh, moved off into space. And so this is the last uh, that we ever saw of it before it moved off um, uh, to its uh, final location in space. Um, this is the building uh, that I'm currently in. Uh, this is a place called the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. Uh, earlier this week, there's a little bit of snow on the ground. The Mission Operations Center where we control the telescope is over on one side of the building. They've turned one side of the building um, into the operation center. The rest of this is mostly offices for people, but this is a building uh, in Baltimore, very, actually pretty close to downtown. And then this is uh, the front door to the Mission Operations Center. We have this nice logo, and I'm going to play this video, and you guys can see what this looks like. So this is the front door. You walk up to it. There are all these offices, right? That's the rest of the building. And let's see. We'll go in. We have this nice display showing a video. And then there's also, they have a very nice model of what James Webb looks like up at the front and I'll pause it here just to point out two things for you. So one, James Webb, the mirror is covered in gold. That's not just, uh, you know, uh, for nice pictures, uh, you know, for nice um, uh, posters or display. When we look at the telescope, the mirrors are actually covered in gold. So the mirrors are covered in gold. 
And then we also have these big silver layers down at the bottom. That's called the sun shield. So the sun shield is there to keep the telescope cold um, and keep everything in the dark. So when the telescope is operating like it is now, the sun shield is in between the mirror and all that telescope stuff and the sun. It's to keep it in the dark and to keep it all cold. So we have this nice model so none of us can forget exactly what this looks like. And then let's see, we'll walk over here. I think I have a better, a little bit better view in a second. So um, I can't go much further. If you look sort of down in the bottom center, there's a little key card reader. Um, I couldn't go much closer. I couldn't go through that door with a key card reader um, to show you guys any closer than this, but I do have a couple of pictures uh, that I was able to take in there. So in front of you right now is what we call the flight operations room or the flight control room. Um, that's where the flight ops team sits. So those are the people, there's probably four or five people in there every day. And they're the ones who are uh, actually controlling the telescope, sending commands to it, uh, making it do things. And then behind that, you can see there's a bunch of computers in a room behind it, also through the glass, is the science instrument room. So that's where I sit. And so in the science instrument room, there are six different stations uh, for all the different major science instruments on the observatory. So I sit at the near camp station um, and then help monitor that camera to make sure everything is working right and that when we need to take pictures, that it's taking images correctly and that everything is working and everybody else monitors their own little section of it. One of the important things when we're doing this is having us all you know, communicating well. There are a lot of people uh, involved in this because there are a lot of very complicated parts of the telescope and nobody understands all the parts of the telescope all the time. So we need to spend a lot of time talking to each other to make sure that we all understand what everybody else is doing uh, and that we're not missing anything when we're running the telescope. So as a part of that, uh, right off of the flight ops room and the science instrument room, we have this uh, uh, big conference room where we all pile into for uh, shift briefings when we come on and when we go off. Uh, and if anything comes up during the, while we're on. We also have, I really like this. So we have all these projectors and TVs set up to try and display status reports. Um, but one of the things that gets used the most is there's this little model JWST that's about, oh, I don't know, it's about six or eight inches long. Um, and that's actually what's used a lot because it turns out it's a lot easier when you have a group of people in a room to pick up a model and point at things when you're trying to understand what's happening where. Uh, and then let's see, that's almost it. Um, there's another back room back there, more computers. We have lockers, uh, just like you have, um, probably at your school, lockers to put your stuff. We have lockers to put our stuff. Um, there's also a secret near cam snack locker, which uh, the other teams try and figure out where we keep our snacks and we don't tell them so they don't eat them. Uh, and I think that's about it. Here's me walking out of this little entry uh, way into the control center. So that's what it looks like. And let's see, I have some pictures actually. So this is what the actual, the science instrument room where I sit, this is where I was sitting two days ago actually, um, looks like. So we have these big computer screens. Um, there's a lot of numbers that get displayed here, right? We don't actually get pictures of what the telescope looks like. We don't have a camera on it to look at it and try and see what's going on. When we check and make sure that everything's working, the way we do that is by looking at uh, what's called these telemetry numbers. Uh, so all these voltages and temperatures and things that let us know that things are still working right. They are helpfully color-coded. You see everything on here is green. That means that everything is good. Everything is helpfully color-coded so that you can look at it um, and immediately tell if something's gone wrong or something's off. Uh, sometimes we even get to watch football when we're back here. This was uh, um, Monday night or Sunday night, actually. This was earlier. This was one of the football uh, playoff games. Um, the sort of head person on any one shift is somebody called the mission operations manager, who's sort of in charge of everybody at any given time. Uh, the mission operations manager, uh, we all call him or her mom, uh, which is a pretty good acronym. So you'll 
be talking to each other and you'll say, oh yeah, mom just told us that we should do this. Or, you know, somebody go tell mom that this has just happened and that we should go to the next thing. So that's a fun uh, little acronym that we all have to watch out for what mom is up to, uh, to keep on top of things. Uh, here are those lockers again. I will reveal to you, I cannot tell the other instrument teams that this one is the near camp snack locker. That's very important. We have all our coffee uh, and stuff in there. Um, though we also have a lot more snacks upstairs. Uh, it turns out uh, when you're doing this, keeping everybody fed is pretty important. So we have a good set of snacks laid in uh, for when we're uh, sitting on console uh, and doing stuff. Most of it in turn for us, uh, most of what we go through the fastest is the coffee. Uh, and then we also have this nice diagram of, or model of the Hubble Space Telescope. That was the, that's also run out of this building. They run both Hubble and um, James Webb. And then here's that little, that little model again that we use in the briefing sometimes. Okay, um, I'll just very quickly tell you about what is the James Webb Space Telescope, right? We've been talking about how it's run, where we actually run it, what actually is it. Um, so James Webb is a space telescope, just like the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, the difference is, is that Hubble is much closer to the Earth. Hubble is in a low Earth orbit, so it's very close to the Earth. Um, James Webb is much further away. James Webb is about five times further away than the moon. Um, so it's much further out from the Earth than the Hubble is. It's also much bigger. The mirror on James Webb is about three times larger than Hubble's. That makes it about five times taller than a person. Um, the excitingly, the mirror, the whole telescope only weighs about half as much as Hubble's. It's three times larger, but weighs half as much because we've gotten much better at building these sorts of large space telescopes. The whole thing, when the, space, when the mirror is deployed and the sun shield is all pulled out, um, it's about the size of a tennis court with the sun shield out, and it's about the height of a three-story building. So this is not a small uh, machine. It's a pretty large thing that we've put in space and we're now operating. Um, we also have an important part is this sun shield that had to get pulled out. Remember in that picture I showed you right at the beginning, everything's folded up. The sun shield has to get unfolded. That's there to keep all the sunlight off the telescope and keep everything cold. We're observing in the infrared, which means that if any part of the telescope is hot, we're going to see the telescope. We're not going to see what we're looking at. So we need to keep the telescope very cold. Um, when I was running it yesterday afternoon, we were at uh, about minus 220 Celsius, so about minus 440 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how cold it is right now um, on the mirror and on the telescope instruments. Um, there are four main instruments. I'll just talk about these very quickly. The one I work on is NearCam. That's right in the middle. There's also NearSpec, Miri, and Nearus. Those all take spectra. They split light up into its components. NearCam does do spectra, but it also takes images. So if you see an image coming from James Webb Space Telescope, a nice pretty picture, um, that is us. Uh, NearCam um, takes those images. So that means that I am one of the, if you see an image um, that wasn't necessarily taken by me, but I was one of the 12 people who probably did take it. Uh, and we had this very nice um, little uh, selfie that we got at JWST. Um, a few days ago. So on the left, this is what the mirror looked like on the ground, everything's folded up. And on the right, this is what the mirror actually looks like in space. So they took this picture, um, the mirror has unfolded, it's all working, um, everything is going uh, very well so far, uh, which is good. Um, I'll just finish up talking about, I mentioned that James Webb is an infrared telescope. So visible light, that's the light that we can see with our eyes. That's mostly what the Hubble Space Telescope uh, looks in. James Webb looks in the infrared. So longer wavelength, lower energy. It's mostly you can think of as infrared light is what things that are hot uh, put out. So one advantage here is that if you look in the infrared, you can see different things. So on the left, I have this picture of this firefighter uh, in the visual, like what you would see if you were standing there, you see all this smoke. It's hard to see the firefighter. You can't see anything else in this room. But if you look in the infrared on the right, suddenly you can see through the smoke and you can see through the dust. And not only can you see through them, but you see things differently, right? The firefighter now is glowing because you can see where he's, uh, you can see sort of closer to his skin where he's hot. You can see a person who's also hot because you know people have a body temperature. So you can, infrared lets us see through smoke and dust, it lets us see things differently. 
So this is going to look at, uh, in particular, exoplanets uh, and let us see deeper into their atmospheres. And to tell you some more about that, uh, Dr. Mansfield is going to explain to us uh, how that all works. So Thomas, there are two hands raised. Maybe you could sure. go from Caleb. Sure, Caleb. Um, I had two questions. Um, one, how long did it take for it to get fully into space? And two, how big is it? Right. So um, to get into space, well, to get into space at the beginning was pretty quick. The whole launch from the ground to up into space took uh, about 12 minutes. Um, but then it took us about 30 days to go from the Earth to out where we need to be for the actual observing. So getting into space was super quick, and then it took us almost a month to actually get out where we were. Um, as to how big it is, so completely unfolded, it's about the size of a tennis court, you know, side to side, and about the height of a three-story building uh, up and down. Um, maybe we should save, do you wanna save the rest of the questions until after Megan goes, or do you wanna uh, do some more now? Let's go ahead and, and have Megan take her turn and we okay. can get some more questions later. Thank you. All right, yeah, we have a lot of question time later, guys. All right. So hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to tell you just a little bit right now about um, what exoplanets are and how James Webb is going to let us learn more about these exoplanets. Okay, so first, what is an exoplanet? So an exoplanet is basically any planet that's not in our own solar system. So in our solar system, we've got eight planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, but it turns out that we think that when you look up at the night sky, pretty much every star that you can see also has a planet or maybe multiple planets around it. Um, so when you look at the sky and you see all the stars, what you're actually seeing are lots and lots of other um, solar systems that also have their own planets. All right, so how do we find exoplanets first? Um, so we're looking for this planet that we wanna find, maybe like the Earth, um, and it's next to a star, maybe like our own sun. Um, but there's one problem if we want to just like, you know, take a picture of a star and look for an exoplanet next to it. And that's that first of all, a star is really bright, so it's gonna be hard to see a planet. And second, if I put these actually to the right sizes relative to each other, a star is actually, um, a planet's actually this big, so this teeny tiny dot, and a star is actually this big. So if you're looking for this teeny teeny tiny dot of this planet next to this really, really, really bright star, it's very difficult to um, just like see the planet next to the star. Um, so one technique we use to find exoplanets is something that's called the transit method. Um, so basically what we do with this is we're looking at a star and it has a planet, the planet's orbiting around the star, and if the system is lined up just right from our point of view, then when the planet's orbiting the star, we'll see it go in front of the star from our perspective. So let's say we're looking at this star with a telescope and we're measuring the amount of light that we can see from that star. I'll back this video up so we can see it again. So when the planet goes in front of that star, it's actually gonna block a little bit of the light we can see from the star. So if we're looking at the amount of light with our telescope over time, we'll see a dip in the amount of light, and then we'll see the star go back to its normal brightness when the planet's done passing in front of it. And then if we see that happen, um, you know, periodically, every single time the planet goes around the star, we can say, oh, we know there's a planet here because we can see these dips in light in the star every single time a planet goes in front of it. Um, whoops, there we go. So using this transit method, we've detected thousands of planets around all different types of stars and all different types of planets as well. Some small like the Earth and Mars, um, some as big as Jupiter um, and all kinds of planets in between those two. Um, we've detected planets that are things like um, Jupiter-sized balls of gas, but they're so close to their stars that they're really, really, really hot and they could have gas blowing off of them. 
Um, and we've even uh, detected some planets that are um, possibly could be something like the Earth, um, maybe a rocky planet that could have rivers and lakes and things like that, where maybe we could find life someday. All right, so now that we've found all these planets, how do we figure out what they're like? Um, and this is where kind of the James Webb Space Telescope is going to come in. Um, so if you imagine again a planet um, going in front of its star like when we detect them through the transit method so the planet's blocking some of the light from the star but if the planet has this little ring of atmosphere around it too we'll see a little bit of the starlight being filtered through the planet's atmosphere and we can actually use that to tell us something about what the atmosphere is made of what it's like maybe how hot it is things like that um, so this is the technique that James Webb is going to use to study a lot of planets and try and figure out what they're like, what they're made of, um, things like that. Um, so that's just kind of a quick overview of um, how James Webb is going to detect planets um, and look at their atmospheres. Um, so maybe I think we have some time for questions right now. Yeah. Yes, and um, we have several people with their hands raised. Um, if we run out of time for verbally asking questions, please know that you can um, you can type them into the chat during the presentation, and we can um, some of our presenters might be able to answer them in the chat. And so I'm going to go ahead and call on. I think Karen is the first uh, we should ask. Okay, morning. Go ahead, uh, Karen. You can unmute and ask your question. Uh, I was just wondering uh, when was the when was the time when like when like what happened what happened on Christmas Day that was that I just was confused by that what happened on there or then <laughs> like when everyone woke up at four in the morning like what happened. I can answer that. That was the day that the uh, James Webb Space Telescope was actually launched into space. And so um, from mm -hmm. our time zone um, in here in Washington, um, that happened to be very early in the morning. But uh, it was kind of random, actually, that it happened on Christmas Day. They just kept on uh, delaying it, but they had to go exactly when the timing was right. So that's when it was. Cool. Uh, so thank, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I'll just quickly add to that, that uh, funnily enough, they also didn't really let a lot of us go down to see the launch because it was happening from the jungle and there wasn't a lot of places for people to come and stay. So uh, very few people actually got to go down and see it. Everybody, even us who worked on it, we had to watch uh, on TV. I also see that, um, I believe it's Jocelyn. Did you have your hand raised to ask a question? Yes, how how heavy is it? Uh, all fully fueled and everything, it is about 14,000 pounds. Uh, That's so a lot. That yeah, I don't know what that is in elephants. That's probably about five, four or five cars. That is heavy. Right, thank you. How about um, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Whitemarsh? Did you have a question? Yes. Are there any planets bigger than Jupiter that are known? I can answer that one. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, so um, we do know some planets that weigh a little bit more than Jupiter. Um, it turns out that once you get bigger than Jupiter, even if the planet weighs more, it stays about the same size, just because the planet's made of a lot of gas and you can kind of compress that gas down. And so even if you make the planet heavier, it stays the same size. But we do know some planets that are bigger. And then when you get even bigger than Jupiter, um, you get to these things that are called brown dwarfs that are kind of like in between being a planet and being a star. And then if you keep going bigger, you get stars. So there's kind of like a whole scale of sizes of things going up, yeah. Thank you. Um, Jose Guzman, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. Um, is a black hole bigger than Jupiter? That is a good question. I think black, so the, so asking about the size of a black hole is a little weird because they're, 
they they they're very very massive but they're actually like very tiny um so you could have a black hole that is smaller than jupiter um even though they're really massive because they're the idea of a black hole is that there are a lot of, of a lot of weight that's concentrated in a very small area yeah yeah so it it, it depends on the black hole the mass mass of the black hole size you know the size can be all different All right, we'll do uh, just one more. Mia Lopez, did you want to ask a question? Yes. Um, what year was it when they launched it on Christmas Day? Uh, so it just launched uh, about a month and a half ago. So 2021, it was this past Christmas. That was my Christmas gift to myself, was a successful launch and uh, deployment. Uh, it's been under construction for a while. The project started, people first started thinking about this about 20 years ago. Um, are any of you guys 20 years old? Anybody? Some of them, no. <laughs> um, so it started about 20 years ago um, and it just launched uh, about a month ago. Also, um, what is a star made of? Oh, a star is made out of gas. It's made out of mainly hydrogen. Um, which, uh, well, you maybe not have run into, but it does have some helium in it, like in a helium balloon. So it's mainly hydrogen with a little bit of helium in it, but it's all gas all the way down. Okay, thank you. Good questions. Um, we'll get to some more of those in a little bit, but right now I'm gonna have Thomas uh, get into some more details about the science he'll be doing with the James Webb Space Telescope and planet formation. Okay. So yeah, so now we have this thing up there. We have all these planets that we know about. What are we actually gonna learn about them, right? Um, so let's see, share a screen again. What are we gonna learn about how planets are made? So planet formation, that's uh, the process by which planets are created. How do we go from a bunch of dust and gas around a very young star to a planet that we can actually walk around on? So uh, mostly uh, planets form by crashing into each other. All the dust sticks together, all the pebbles and rocks stick together, and eventually you get something that are like little tiny planets, and then they keep getting bigger because they crash into each other and they stick together. Um, and this process is something we call accretion. These things are accreting, they're slamming into each other, they're sticking to each other, and we want to understand how this process works. And we want to know, uh, what sort of things are crashing into each other, and we also want to know where they're crashing into each other. Um, because the material that makes a planet that's orbiting a star before planets are formed, it's all this dust and gas and stuff, um, the, uh, what that material is composed of, is it ice, is it rock, is it super weird ice, like methane ice or something, depends on how far away you are from your star. If you're closer to your star, you're too hot. And so you can't have any of this weird ice or even water ice like we're used to. You just get rock. And if you're further out, you get a lot of ice because there's a lot of water out there. So you get a lot of water. Sometimes you can even get things like methane. So um, what we want to do is we want to try and understand where planets form, how far away from the stars they are. And we want to try and understand how they form. How does this crashing together process work and how fast does it occur? Because the basic idea is we want to understand where the Earth comes from. We want to understand where the Earth and the other planets in the solar system came from, how they were made, um, and get a better understanding of, are there going to be other planets like Earth uh, elsewhere in the universe around other stars? So I just said, um, this is a little bit of a, a diagram that sort of shows about how the uh, what's in the disk, that's what we call it. It's a disk of material. It's a, all the dust and gas gets flattened out and spins around the star and what looks like a plate or a disk. Um, how that disk material, what's in it changes uh, depending upon how far away you are from the star. So by looking at what the planets are made out of now, right? We can look at the planets with JWST and we can use JWST to figure out what are the planets made out of right now? And what we're gonna try and do is use that to figure out, okay, if we know what they look like now and what they're made out of, 
how can we figure out what sort of things had to crash together and when they had to crash together to be able to form the planet that we see today, to be able to give it the composition, meaning the, the set of elements and material that's in it uh, that we see today. It's a little bit like taking a chocolate cake and instead of eating it, uh, like probably we all would like to, instead of eating it, you pull it apart and you really dissect it and you try and figure out from that finished chocolate cake, okay, what are the ingredients that went into the chocolate cake? You could probably figure out, okay, well, there's gotta be chocolate. Uh, there's some frosting. Uh, it's pretty sweet, right? There's sugar, uh, probably some eggs and salt and flour and all this other, I don't know if I can even name all this stuff, milk, uh, butter, I think. Anyway, right? There's a lot of ingredients going to a chocolate cake. And you probably, if you sat down, you could probably come up with a pretty good list just looking at a cake of what are the ingredients that went into it. And then once you have the ingredients, you could think of, okay, what would I have to do to bake these so that it actually turned into a cake, right? How would I have to mix them together and how would I have to bake them so that they turned into a cake? And that's exactly what we're trying to do with the planets is we have the planets right now. We have a chocolate cake uh, or we have a planet that we can see today that's gone through this whole baking or formation process. And we wanna figure out what is it made out of so that we can understand what had to have happened to bake it or form it into its current, uh, into its current state. Um, and JWST is gonna let us do this. This is a little bit of a complicated picture, um, but it's just showing you all of the different molecules like water, and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and methane and ammonia and some weird iron stuff um, that we're gonna be able to measure with the James Webb Space Telescope. So when we start doing science operations and taking uh, these measurements in the summer, we're gonna get super good measurements of what planets are made out of. And that's what's gonna try it. That's what's gonna let us get a much better understanding of what planets are made, how planets are made by trying to work out how this baking process had to have happened from what we see today. Uh, yeah, so that's gonna give us a much better idea of how planets are made and how they form and how common they are around stars uh, elsewhere in the galaxy. Okay, I'll stop there and I'll let Megan uh, or Dr. Mansfield uh, keep going. Yeah, let me pull my phone. All right, so I'm going to tell you a little bit now about how we can use the James Webb Space Telescope to look for signs of habitability or how we can figure out which planets could have alien life on them. Um, but first, I was actually hoping that you guys could help me out a little bit by brainstorming what characteristics do you think a planet would need to have life? So if we're looking for the planet that this minion came from, what are some of the things that you would definitely think would need to be there for life. Um, you can type into the chat or um, I see a few people raising hands. Um, maybe if you just wanna unmute, say what comes to your mind first. Um, or I can call in a couple people too, Xanadu. Or um, Elijah, Matthias. It looks like a in. minion on there. I can read to you, Megan. Uh, I see some in the chat. I can see some. So I see a lot of people saying water. That's a really good one. When the atmosphere. Earth, Earth got destroyed by an asteroid. Okay, we don't want the planet to get destroyed by an asteroid. That's a good one. Yeah, so I see a lot of really good ones here. Um, I see someone mentioned something called the Goldilocks zone, too. Um, so that's a really important one. So we don't we don't want our planet to be too cold or too hot, right? Because if we freeze our minion or we boil our minion, they won't be able to have a good life. And so we want it to be just the right temperature. Um, so for astronomers, we call this something called um, the habitable zone, um, which is an area that's just the right distance from the star where we think it's a good temperature for life. So like in our solar system, Earth is just right. It's in the habitable zone. If we went to Mars, we'd be too cold. If we went to Venus, we'd be too hot. Um, I see, Matthias, you have your hand raised. Did you have one you wanted to suggest too? Um, also, my name is Matthias, but- uh, Matthias, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I would think the, the uh, life, if life was, if life on another planet was supposed to be like that, I would be like, I would think they would need oxygen, water, and like mm -hmm. 
and food so they can live, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of the same ones that everybody's suggesting. Water, food, air, those are all really important things for life. So we definitely want our minion to be able to breathe. We want them to have water. Um, for food, uh, all of the planets that are orbiting stars, that's a good way to like make sure that they'll have food because they can have things like plants that get their energy from the star and then bigger animals can eat the plants. So um, they'll be good for food. Okay, so what are the ways that we might detect this life then? We have our basic ingredients. We want the planet to not be too hot. We want it to not be too cold. We want it to have water. We want it to have air. Um, so for the not too hot, not too cold, we can do that thing where we're looking for the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone around these stars, where we want to make sure the planet is just the right temperature for life. Um, if we're looking for uh, making sure that there's air, we want to know that our aliens can breathe. Um, so we can look at these planets using that transit method and make sure that the planet does have an atmosphere. Um, we might even be able to use JWST to look for specific gases. Um, so like on Earth, we breathe oxygen in and we breathe out carbon dioxide. And then we um, plants take in carbon dioxide and they put oxygen out. So um, gases like carbon dioxide are things that um, the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to look for. So we can look for some of those gases. Um, and then also we said that we definitely want there to be water because um, everything needs something uh, everything needs something to drink. And so um, for our life to have enough water um, on Earth, we have our water cycle where we've got the oceans and we've got clouds, the rain water. And um, looking at the atmospheres of these planets with James Webb, we'll also be able to look for clouds and water in the atmosphere and stuff like that so that we can also make sure that our life would have water. All right, so that's... Um, everything that I had, and I think we're going to take some questions again. All right, and we have, um, I'm going to call on James Rhodes. Do you have your hand raised, or would you like to ask a question? James Rhodes, okay. you can go ahead. Uh. Why are there so many planets if there is only eight in the solar system? Right, so there's eight planets in our solar system, and we were looking at that whole picture that had so many other planets, and those are what they're looking for in other solar systems out beyond beyond ours and around other stars. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So if you imagine every star you see in the sky when you go outside, if all of those have a solar system too, that means there's tons of other planets out there that aren't in our own solar system. Great, thank okay. you. Thanks. How about um, Alexander? Alexander Bolanos, Barriento. If a command goes wrong, what would happen? Can you ask that again? I didn't hear the first part. If a command would go wrong, what happened to the telescope? If one of the commands goes wrong? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Um, so one of the one of the things we have to watch out for is that there are all these computers that are running the telescope. And on the earth, if you're sitting at your laptop and the computer crashes, right? Something goes wrong and the computer stops working, you can unplug it and you can plug it back in. You can't do that with James Webb, right? It's in the middle of space. So if something goes wrong, um, usually the computers are set up so that instead of crashing, we'll go into something called safe mode. And we'll, everything will drop down to its very bottom level and then we'll try and uh, reboot things from there. I will say that trying to prevent this, that when we send commands to the telescope, there are a lot of people who are looking at them. So when we send a command to the telescope, there are probably at least eight people. There's somebody who's written it down, and then there are eight people who look at it on its way uh, until it actually gets sent, uh, when it actually, to double check that it's written down correctly, and even when it's typed in. So yesterday, 
we were issuing commands and the, the flight ops person who actually hits enter and sends them up, she was talking to me and she says, okay, I've just typed this into the computer. Does this literally like all the command look exactly right? And I have a big document in front of me where I look up and I say, yes, that looks right. And she hits enter. So there's a lot of double checking to make sure that things are getting sent up correctly. Thanks. It's good to know that there's lots of checks and double checks on all of these um, for you know such an important mission. Um, I'm going to take a, a question from the chat. Ashrita asks, does Jupiter have different velocities of its atmospheric layers? Yeah, I can answer that question. Um, yeah, so um, if you've seen a picture of Jupiter, you know, can you like, you picture it has those like bands on it, right? So those bands are actually caused by winds on Jupiter, um, and each of them moves at a slightly different speed than all the other ones and that's why it has that like banded look and that's something that might happen on other planets too um so yeah um i saw actually another good question in the chat too if i can um someone asked during uh a while ago i think while i was talking um sophia said maybe some aliens don't need oxygen too um and that's a really good point that um, I was talking about things that life on the earth needs, um, but we don't know if alien life would need all those things. And so something a lot of scientists are working on right now is um, looking at like thinking about using chemistry for how we could figure out um, whether there would be life when we don't necessarily know whether the life is going to be just like us. Will they breathe oxygen? Will they have, you know, need carbon dioxide too? things like that? Um, and so one thing, um, like an example of what you can look for if you're trying to find alien life when you don't know what you're looking for is you can look for gases that if you just did normal chemistry, you wouldn't think that they would exist together. Um, so an example of that on the Earth is our atmosphere has um, a lot of um, methane in it and all that methane comes from animals on Earth. Um, but we would expect if we just took a bunch of gas from the earth and put it in a box with no life on it, that all the methane would go away. So we can use that as a way of saying, ah, there's some chemistry that we wouldn't expect to see if there wasn't life on earth. So that could be a sign of life. Um, so we can use things like that to try and look for aliens, even if we don't know um, what kind of uh, life they are. And note that at the beginning, until like 2 billion, even until 2 billion years old, when the Earth was young, we did not have oxygen. And then we had life. We had life pretty early. So there were different kind of life at then. And we may, there may be those life in other exoplanets. That's true. It might just be getting started, like just like it started on Earth. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, ask, um, I see Rusty has a uh, hand raised. Rusty, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yeah, so my question is, uh, how much farther can the James Webb telescope see from the Hubble telescope? Because the Hubble telescope's been around for a long time and it's able to see like a lot farther than we ever, ever have before. So I'm just wondering like, how much farther can the James Webb see? Yeah, so, um, well, so there are two things happening. So one, James Webb has a mirror that's about three times larger in diameter than the Hubble mirror. Um, so that means it gets about 10 times as much light. So if Hubble and James Webb look at the same star, uh, Webb will get 10 times as much light. And um, so probably be able to measure what's going on a lot better than Hubble is just because we're getting a lot more light. So that's a large part of it. Um, so just from the, those light considerations, we're getting 10 times as much light. That probably means we can see three or four times farther than Hubble can. But the other part is that uh, Webb is observing in the infrared, right? Hubble's observing in the visible. And a lot of the very first galaxies that are formed uh, are formed very early in the universe, but because the universe is expanding to us, all those galaxies looks like they're moving away from us very quickly because we're seeing the universe's expansion. And that, uh, that recession velocity, that moving away from us quickly means that the light from those galaxies is shifted. Instead of being visible starlight, like we're used to seeing, it gets shifted into the infrared. So James Webb will be able to see some of the first galaxies as they're forming. 
Uh, and that's because it's a combination of, it's got a bigger mirror and it's observing in the infrared where all these galaxies uh, light uh, are occurring. So we're hoping it should literally allow us to see the first galaxies as they, as they start forming. Well, there's a lot of good questions coming in, um, especially in the chat too. Um, I'm gonna call out one that uh, someone asked, why are the, the mirrors on the James Webb Space Telescope hexagonal? Um, I would say, you know, it's because uh, they need to fit together efficiently and, and that's a tessellating shape. Um, but, you know, Thomas, you may have more to add about that. Nope, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, they need to fit together. Um, the reason why we didn't build a single giant mirror is that the mirrors themselves, there's a thin layer of gold on them, but the actual mirror themselves is made out of beryllium, which is a pretty weird element. Um, and uh, you can make a little piece of beryllium about that big into the right shape for a mirror, but it's very hard to make a whole piece of beryllium into a, you know, 20 foot diameter mirror. So you can make beryllium into these little pieces. You couldn't make it into a big one. So that was one reason to have them be in segments to be in pieces rather than have one giant mirror. Good, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna call on uh, another one that has their hand raised. How about Mia? Did you wanna unmute and ask a question, Mia Lopez? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. If would it be possible in the future to uh, like add another planet? Can you please repeat that? To possible in the future to add another what? Planet to our solar system. To add another planet to our solar system. Would another planet form in our solar system? I guess I can answer that one. Um, that's a good question. So um, Unfortunately, we are probably stuck with the number of planets we have. We don't get another one, um, mostly because um, so when Dr. Beatty was describing how all of these planets are like um, formed from rocks crashing together and getting bigger and more rocks crashing together, that all happened um, a really long time ago when our solar system was really long, young and there was a lot of dust and gas around. And then um, after a while, pretty much all of that dust either turned into a planet or it fell onto our star, um, or some of it might've got like blown away. Some of the gas blew away out of our solar system. So now our solar system's pretty empty. So we don't really have enough stuff um, left to make another planet. Um, but we do have a lot of other cool stuff left over from when all the planets formed, um, like the asteroids in the asteroid belt. We think a lot of those might be smaller bits of rocks and things like that that didn't quite make it into turning into a whole planet but are still left over from when all the planets were forming okay thank you Thanks, i think we have we should probably answer some of the pre-asked questions too pauline yeah and did uh did thomas or megan have some of those picked out that they wanted to start with thomas uh, yeah, why don't we do one more and I will pull those up. Like call on somebody and I'll, um, I'll pull them up while we're... I can pick out one of the, I guess I can pick out one of them. Let's see. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, um, what do you expect to discover using the James Webb telescope? Is there anything you're looking for? Um, so I'm definitely very excited for seeing if we can look for signs of life on planets. Um, we don't necessarily think that um, James Webb is gonna um, like find life definitely because it'll probably take a lot of detailed searching to make sure like yes that's definitely life it's not just a tricky planet that looks like it might have life but we were wrong um, so I'm but I'm really excited about starting to understand that a little more um, and there's also some other planets that I'm excited about um, like there's a type of planet that's called sub-Neptunes that, um, so in our solar system, we don't really have any planets that are in between size between Earth and Neptune. We have four small rocky planets and then four bigger planets and nothing too much in between. But it turns out that lots of other stars have planets that are these in-between sizes. And we really don't know a lot about like, why did those stars end up with a planet like that? Why doesn't our solar system have a planet like that? Or what are those planets even made of and what are they like? Um, so I'm interested in learning more about all those kinds of planets. 
Uh, and I can do some off the submitted questions as well. Oops, I just had it. So I'll do, I can, I'm gonna do two really quickly. First one is for Mrs. Bush's class, how expensive and how many was the telescope to make and how many people worked on it? Um, so all together, uh, James Webb has cost about $10 billion. Uh, and a lot of that is paying people to work on it. Like uh, my salary is paid for by some of that $10 billion. Uh, and there's probably about 2000 people uh, who work on it all together. So there's a lot of people. We actually, there is one giant email list that goes out to all 2000 people, uh, which you have to be very careful sending emails to because there's no moderation. So literally anybody could send e an email to it, which has been hilarious sometimes. Uh, and the second question um, is uh, somebody else in Mrs. Bush class asked, uh, what are the names of the colors after purple? Uh, so I'm gonna be honest, I actually polled everybody else in the science instrument room yesterday. Um, to see if we could come up with a good list of names for the colors. Uh, I would say, I don't think we came up with any good names. Uh, there aren't any good names for the colors. So the only colors that we have are an optical light, visible light that we can see. Um, and most of the wavelengths that we look at, like with the James Webb and the infrared that we can't see with our eyes, we don't have names for those colors. Instead, we talk about them, uh, the way we talk about them is we use the wavelength of light that those, um, uh, those parts of uh, light are at. So we'll talk about something at two microns, that's a wavelength, or four microns. Most of what we see with our eyes is at about half a micron. Um, so we use wavelength instead of color names to talk about where we're looking. Thank you for those. And I know, um... There have been so many more questions that have come up. Um, maybe I'll ask just one more and then we're gonna wrap it up for today. Um, I'm going to call on one more person that hasn't been called on yet. Uh, maybe Genesis, Genesis Garcia, did you wanna ask a question? Yes, uh, can a star turn into a planet? I didn't quite catch that. Can you say one more time, please? Can a star turn into a planet? I can answer that one. Um, yeah, so, so the short answer is no. And the longer answer is that the difference between stars and planets is really how big they are. Um, so stars are a lot bigger than planets. And um, the thing that makes them stars is they get so big and so hot in the middle that um, all of that gas that Dr. Beatty mentioned, they're made out of hydrogen gas, um, that can start fusing together into bigger elements. So like the hydrogen fuses into helium and that causes a lot of heat and a lot of light. And that's what makes stars um, look like they're burning. Um, that's what makes them look hot. Um, so that only happens in really, really big things. Um, and planets are a lot smaller than stars. So that's why um, planets don't look really bright when you look at them the way stars do, because they're not um, releasing all of this light and this heat from um, fusing elements together. Um, so that's kind of the basic difference between like the planets, which are a little smaller, um, and the stars, which are bigger and can make light. Thank you. Another good question. I'm going to um, encourage everyone to just keep on thinking about all these questions that you have. There are um, some great websites uh, that NASA has put together that answer a lot of these questions too about the James Webb Space Telescope. And I would like to also let you know that um, you have the opportunity to have the REACH Museum come and visit your classroom with our mini mobile museum um, and bring some hands-on activities to help you learn more about the science and engineering of the James Webb Space Telescope and other topics that are relevant to our museum as well. Um, you can either contact me to uh, set that up and I will put my contact information in the chat before we leave today. Um, you can also visit our website visit thereach.us and click on the education tab to learn more about all of our programs. Thank you so much for, um, for joining us today and for being here for this event. If you would like to support the REACH Museum to help bring you more programs like this, 
Um, you can visit our website uh, and also the foundation website, which I'm gonna go ahead and put in the chat um, to make a donation. You can also consider becoming a REACH member and that gets you free admission throughout the year um, and um, admission to our events. It also can get you admission or discounts to other museums throughout North America. And a big, big thank you to, once again, to Dr. Serena Kim for all her help putting this together, um, to Dr. Thomas Beatty and Dr. Megan Mansfield from the University of Arizona. Thank you so much for, for uh, sharing this time with us and um, all the preparation you did for this today. Let's give a big round of applause, everyone. So if there are more questions, if you would like to ask, um, you can ask and the, yeah, you can ask us and then we'll get back to you. Yes, I'm gonna go ahead and put my email um, address in the chat too. Um, you can always send uh, questions to, to me and I can forward them on if I can't answer them. And thank you again for being here today. Can everybody on mute and say, Yep, Say hello and bye. Those are all super good questions. Yeah, we can actually answer some questions. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. We can stay longer. We can answer more questions. Yeah, I can stay for a little bit. Okay. Yeah, if there's anybody that wants to to still ask some questions. Um, as long as people are still here with their hands raised, I can go ahead and call on them. And if you have to go, you have to go, that's fine. Um, I see Emmanuel Whitemarsh, are you still? Yeah, Emmanuel, did you have a question? Um, could Neptune support, for example, penguins? Penguins on Neptune, because it's cold. Like underwater. Yeah, so when you look at Neptune, it does kind of look like water, right? But what you're actually seeing is gas. Neptune is has a lot of gas there. Um, so it doesn't really have something probably like what the Earth has, where we have a surface with like water and land that you can walk on. So it might be kind of hard to get life on Neptune because um, it's actually mostly made of gas. Yeah. Good question. How about, yeah, how about Caleb Johnson? You've had your hand up for a while. Um, I had one question, and that is, how do you think a galaxy is formed? Uh, well, I don't know if Serena, if you want no, to No, that's know. galaxy, so it's gravity. So basically galaxies, stars, they are all formed because of the gravity and galaxy form formation is actually a big field, how they actually form. But you know, at the end, the universe was very young and there are materials, gas, and then the stars start forming where, you know, somewhere that was a little bit denser. So they also rotate and the gravity is doing the magic basically. So the answer is gravity. Good. How about um, Alexander? Did you have a question? Yes. Dr. Thomas was saying that the telescope can be in space for 20 to 30 years. Why is the reason just so little time? Well, um, so one thing is, is we need to use fuel to keep the telescope in its um, in its location in space. So we don't need to use fuel to keep the telescope in space. It'll stay in space no matter what we do, but we want it to stay in a very particular location called a Lagrange point, which is named for a French mathematician who lived about 200 years ago who figured these places out. So we want it to stay at this place. So we need to use fuel to keep it there. And we have about, we have enough fuel to stay there for about 20 or 30 years. But another thing is, is that after about 20 or 30 years, all the computers and the motors and everything, all the machine parts of the telescope will probably start wearing out as well. And unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, we can't go up and fix anything. 
So when things break, they're broken and we can't go up and fix them. So the expectation is, is that after about 20 or 30 years, we will either run out of fuel or things will start breaking. Um, so that's why we think uh, we'll get about that long of use out of it. Okay, thank you. Good. How about um, Landon? Why Landon? Or did you have a question? Yeah, I had two, but I'm more interested. Uh, so I'm pretty sure Thomas said uh, that we, we can't like fix it because I'm pretty sure he said we can't fix it because it's more far away than the last one we, they put up there. And my second question was, I'm not sure if this is true, but I heard that there was over 40, someone told me that there was over 40 million galaxies. Uh, well, I can talk about the fixing part. So that's right. Um, well, so I guess I shouldn't say we can't fix it. It would be very difficult to fix it. I think it would be possible probably to send out um, a team of astronauts uh, to fix it. Um, it would probably just be very difficult to do so. So it would depend on what broke and when, uh, when things broke. Um, it may also be, depending upon what broke, it would probably be hard to get in and get to it. It wasn't designed to be opened up in space. So the Hubble Space Telescope was designed to be opened up and you could pull cameras out and put new cameras in because um, they figured the astronauts would be going up. But uh, for James Webb, it's not designed to do that. So you might, you might be able to be clever and figure something out, but it'd be very difficult to go fix it. It's probably better to say that impossible. Uh, as to how many galaxies there are, uh, I'm not sure we know. Right, because the universe extends. Yeah, about, like the people variety. said, about two hundred billion galaxies. Thomas, is that I mean that's not an estimate. Um, we we teach that number of galaxies in our astrobiology class, assuming how many stars. I mean, how many galaxies are there? I mean, there are some galaxy counts. Now, it's uh, it's kind of a hard thing to do, but it's the order of about hundreds of billions of galaxies. Do you think in the future we'll be able to go to new galaxies instead of staying in this one, instead of exploring planets? Uh, oh, Megan, why don't you do that one? Oh, it's okay. You can. <laughs> oh, I was just, I think we're going to get the same answer. Galaxies are super far away. So even the closest star to the Earth is super far away, and it would take us a super long time to get there. Uh, Probably if you were driving in a car, it would take you about a million years to get to the nearest star. And the nearest galaxy is about a million times farther away. So um, if you were, if you're going, even if you're going very fast, it would take you a super long time to get there. So uh, I don't want to say it's impossible that we'll never do it, but it uh, won't happen anytime soon if people do try to fly to another galaxy. It's okay. very far away from us. Thank you. Thanks. There's one more hand up if you have time for uh, to answer Jordan's question. Jordan, did you want to ask? Um, how many planets can you see from the the thing? Telescope. The telescope. Yeah, so I can answer this one. Um, so we've found um, about 4,000 planets now, I think. Um, so most of the planets we've found have been um, in like around particular stars, basically just depending on where we've pointed the telescopes that are looking for these planets. Um, and based on how many planets we've found there, so we know of these 4,000 planets, but um, by counting how many planets we found, we think that pretty much every star in the Milky Way has a planet. I have a question too. I just recently learned that, you know, that there are exoplanets out there that are, that are not attached to a star. I'm just wondering how common that is, or maybe we don't even know because it's hard to see them, right? Uh, there was actually a big thing about that a few years ago where there was a study that said they were, uh, that they were very common um, and everybody, it sort of made a big sort of kerfuffle. Um, 
but people looked more closely at the data and I think they aren't that common. They do exist. There are planets that um, probably what happened when the planets were forming around a star, uh, two of them got close to each other and one of them stayed and one of them gets kicked out into deep space. Um, so there are some planets that are just drifting around, not near a star, but um, we think there's not too many of them actually. They probably wouldn't be likely to support any life too if they don't have that energy input from a star, so. Uh, yes, they would all be extremely cold. Mm -hmm. All right, are there um, last call for questions? Um, and thank you to our speakers for you know staying on a little bit longer. Um, I don't see any other hands raised at the moment. <clears throat> um, and I'm not sure if I were, if there were any others in the chat that we didn't get to. Alexander, is that hand still raised? Yeah. How far away is the telescope from Earth? Or Earth? Oh, it is uh, one and a half million miles. So it's about five times further away than the uh, from the Earth than the Moon is. Okay. Thank you. A little too far to visit. Right. All right, well, I know that, uh, I know that our speakers probably have a busy day ahead and thank you one more time for, for joining us today. It's been awesome to, to get that view from, from uh, where scientists are you know, working on the telescope and, and also just to hear, you know, hear the, that, um, I hear that the students have such great questions and um, there's still a lot more to learn. So once again, another round of applause and thank you for joining us today. Yep, it was a pleasure. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for organizing this one, Pauline. <laughs>